in the name of the infinite, the beginning before all beginnings and the ending after all ends, the source of beauty, love, and mercy. We welcome you this evening and we will begin our evening with a prayer by Dr. Hassan Hathout. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Malik yawm al-Din. Iyaka na'bud wa iyaka nasta'in. اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين آمين Inform my subjects that I am the forgiver the merciful, we ask you to forgive us our sins. For who else to forgive all sins but you? Grant us being forgiven and grant us being forgivers. Cleanse our hearts from hatred, even to those who hate us. Let us forgive, as you said in the Quran, let them forgive, let them forgo. Don't you wish that God would forgive you? Oh God, Show our enemies the truth and guide them to justice. Then forgive them, for they do not know. O oh, forgiver, O oh, compassionate, O oh, Allah, in the raging war, between good and evil. Enable us to be soldiers for right against wrong, for light against darkness, for peace against war, and for fairness against injustice. For you are the truth, the just, the light, and the peace. May it please you, God, to shed your prayers and the blessings upon our beloved Prophet Muhammad and all your messengers and the prophets and those who follow your guidance till the day of judgment. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Uh, for those that knew Dr. Hassan, uh, I'm sure there are people here that feel that that voice and those words, they just soothe, soothe the heart and uh, encourage the conscience. I'd like to introduce Dr. Ziba Vanek for a brief Quranic recitation before we begin our program. Allah 
ولم يكن له كفوا in the name of god the most gracious the most merciful proclaim he is the one and the only god the absolute god never did he beget nor was he begotten none equals him That's beautiful. Thank you very much, Dr. Vanek. Allow me to say just a few words about the foundation uh, before we hear uh, from the uh, brilliant mind uh, for whom it was founded. The Hassan Hathout Legacy Foundation uh, was built in 2009 as the exclusive caretaker of the diverse and sizable work produced by Dr. Hassan Hathout. That work exists in the fields of academic medicine and medical ethics humanities theology the abrahamic faiths islam and its ethics interfaith dialogue literature and poetry the foundation was established to spread the message of love in god very intentional phrase of a love in god through the works and spirit of hassan hathout for the betterment of humanity The goals of the foundation include providing resources and opportunities to enable learning about Islam as believed in and practiced by Dr. Hassan Hathout. I will highlight just three initiatives of the many that are being pursued by the foundation. The first and a major priority of the foundation is to establish a research library for those interested in learning more about Dr. Hassan's encyclopedic personality. This corpus will also serve those aimings to preserve Hassan Hathout's memory as a man of God, a man of science, and a man of love. Number 2, the foundation works to further the writings of Dr. Hassan and an announcement that can be made pursuant to that is that reading the muslim mind one of the foundational texts for muslim americans in their search for an authentic and organic identity that is authentic within the classical understandings of islam and is organic to the reality of muslim life here in america that book reading the muslim mind has now been printed in french spanish German and Chinese and some of these translations are available on our website the website of the foundation finally there is an annual essay contest for children aged 10 through 13 as they sit in 5th through 8th grade it is an annual contest in which children write an essay pursuant to the title how to grow a loving heart and as you can see the work of the foundation is purposed for furthering the ideas that dr hassan taught us as a community and helped establish here in southern california among all brothers and sisters of faith among all all lovers of the beloved and so now i'd like to draw your attention to the screen for a short documentary about dr hassan hathout and in love that we shall forever be with you uh, this legacy uh, is led by a formidable individual and a beloved leader of our community i would like to begin the second portion of our evening by inviting our next guest to begin our dialogue dr iba hathout the daughter of dr hassan hathout is professor 
and Chief of the Division of Pediatric Endocrinology and Diabetes at Loma Linda University School of Medicine. She is mother to Sara Shahawi at Harvard Medical School and Hassan Shahawi at Harvard University. Ibet is the founding president of the Hassan Hathout Legacy Foundation. Please join me in offering your love to Dr. Ibet Hathout. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Behold, let not those among you who are endowed with grace and amplitude resolve by oath against helping their kinsmen. Let them forgive and overlook. Do you not wish that God should forgive you? These divine words from the Qur'an resonate with people of many faiths. What is frequently referred to as forgiveness to the followers of Abraham is the passionate voice of God within us. Today's theme of reconciliation was not born in a vacuum. And as much as I abhor politics, Ignoring its happenings in our nation, in the Middle East, and throughout the world today cannot make invisible the elephant in the room. Division and hatred, not only within the same nation, within the same religion, but even within the same family. What hardships could have rendered so many hearts blind to their original and essential calling? And lest Muslims in the room should bear the burden of guilt, let us remember what went on in our America not too long ago. And the words of President Lincoln describing the two sides of the Civil War, both read the same Bible, and pray to the same God, and each invokes his aid against the other. For our new visitors, I'll share the story behind our grand title. In his last book, Audible Silence, Hassan Hathout wrote of a French parliamentarian he met in Switzerland, a former member of the French resistance, she used to harbor immense hatred to all Germans. One day, as she was rushing out of a conference in anger because of the arrival of a German delegate, an American of faith told her, do you think you can rebuild Europe without the Germans? In solitude, she struggled with herself for three days. Then came out and for the first time sat with the Germans and reported horror stories which fueled her hatred to their country. After she was all done, a German lady quietly replied, My husband was involved in the plot against Hitler. He was arrested and executed. I am left alone to raise our two children. I apologize if our response was not early or strong enough. The two women held hands and prayed. Ushering a reconciliation between France and Germany, which was to change the face of Europe and the world forever. Irene Lohr titled her biography, Pour l'amour de demain, For the Love of Tomorrow. In a booklet about forgiveness in Islam, Hassan Hathout wrote, God's forgiveness to human beings is an axial issue in the relation between the two. 
to pass the accountability test. No one could rely on a perfect record. As human beings, full hope is in God's grace, mercy, and forgiveness. In Islam, God is not just the absolutely just, but also the absolutely merciful and forgiving. We ask of God to deal with us with his mercy, not with his justice. A hope that is supported by the saying of the prophet, when God decreed the creation, he pledged himself by writing in his book, my mercy prevails over my wrath. Forgiveness as an interhuman ethic is a mandatory value and an important virtue. Common sense tells us that the more people are guided by their forgiving nature, the happier they are. At the individual, family, national, or international level, Islam enjoins on its followers to be forgiving for as much as they yearn to be forgiven. Although Islam is both a moral code and a legal system, it emphasizes that whoever can secure justice but opts to transcend it to forgiveness is more virtuous, nobler, and nearer to God. Personally, I think of this as the ultimate jihad, the ethereal dimension that entitled man to be God's vicegerent on earth. To be worthy of this honor, we need to enliven the spirit of God within us. In a recent Easter sermon I attended, the Reverend Ed Bacon described this transformation as changing from being a cocoon wrapped around oneself to being a butterfly with enough space for grace within to serve grace in others. When one is faced with oppression or aggression, there is a nanosecond for choosing how to react. Some in this room know exactly what that means. Having to painfully exfoliate layers of hurt and self-pity and fly like a butterfly. Why? You may be familiar with what Hassan Hatout believed to be the mission statement of Islam, God's order in the Quran, we have sent you for nothing but mercy to the worlds. As individuals and nations, a spiritual dimension is essential not only for our happiness and inner peace, but also for our national security and for peace throughout the world. When Prophet Muhammad asked the angel Gabriel about forgiveness, he replied, your Lord commands you to forgive those who harm you, pardon those who deny you, and visit those who sever their relations with you. Sounds familiar? The Muslim affirmation of the words of Jesus? Well, surprise! There is a God, and he's not mine or yours, he's ours. And so it is together that we perpetually navigate spiritual heights to achieve the power to forgive and see the light of God, that which guided us to here and now. Questions remain. What is beyond forgiveness? How can a sense of injustice be channeled? And how can the force of forgiveness build a fortress of peace? We are about to reflect on a number of journeys of reconciliation by people who are more than equipped to share them. And as we do, let us not ignore the beautiful mosaic 
of religious threads in this hall. I shall leave you with Hassan Hatout's verse. Friends in faith rise while you still have a choice on the wings of love soar above and sing with your hearts not only your voice God is love, God is love, God is love. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ibat. Now we're fortunate to have three brilliant minds and uh, three beautiful hearts uh, to speak to us from varying faith traditions. They will each come and give a short word, return to their seats, and at the end, Dr. Ibat will moderate for us a panel discussion among them. Christopher K Key Chapel is the Navin and Pratima Doshi Professor of Indic and Comparative Theology at Loyola Marymount University. He served as Assistant Director of the Institute for Advanced Studies of World Religions. He teaches Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism. His published books include Karma and Creativity, a co-translation of the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali, and Nonviolence to Animals, Earth, and Self in Asian Traditions. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Chris Key Chapel. It's a great honor to stand here before you tonight. And I arrived in Los Angeles in 1985 with the grand task of teaching all of the non-Christian, all of the non-Catholic traditions to our students at Loyola Marymount University. So not only do I teach the religions listed, but I do a survey. And I originated a course that focused on Islam at LMU. And in those early years, in the 1980s, he was so gracious, Dr. Hattut, to welcome us to the center, to give us the basics, and to explain lovingly that wisdom that we heard in his own words and in the words of his daughter tonight. So I have very fond memories of the pilgrimages that we would make to Vermont Avenue and to the Islamic Center of Southern California. Second of all, I want to lift up two moments of reconciliation that have been important in my faith development and just put forward one very small minor example of how each of us can walk the path of reconciliation regardless of what challenges we may encounter. And I'm hearkening back first to 1999. The Parliament of the World's Religions was held in Cape Town, South Africa. Nelson Mandela created time in his very busy schedule to be with us to be with the several hundred delegates from all around the world representing all the faith traditions. And recall this is the early years of the reconciliation that continues within South Africa. Less than five years prior, apartheid came to an end. The defining moment, one of the great defining moments of reconciliation in the 20th century. And he stood before us and he said, you, you the people of faith are the people who have paved the way and will continue to pave the way for peace. And he said, without faith, I could not stand before you. We had visited Robben Island. We stood in the cell where he had been confined for all of those long years. And we saw the ruins 
of those faith places that were so liberating for him as a political prisoner. And he pointed first with his mind's eye to the Hindu temple. And he said, in that Hindu temple, I learned the wisdom of the Bhagavad Gita. I learned that you must be devoted to a cause and pursue that cause without worrying about how it will turn out. That you must keep your devotion through all the toils and travails. And then he pointed with his mind's eye to the mosque on Robben Island. And he said, in the Quran, I learned the power of seeing all human beings as equal. And he talked about church. And he lifted up forgiveness as the foundation for reconciliation and said, from Jesus we learn that not only must we forgive ourselves, we must ask humbly of forgiveness from others. Second example. Another great thing happened in the 1990s. The conflict between Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland was largely put to rest. I myself come from a mixed marriage. My family had Protestant background in America. My wife's family was a good Irish Catholic family. And when we married, and we married as teenagers, we're on the verge of our 40th wedding anniversary, we didn't know if it would be okay. We didn't even know if all of our parents would show up we ended up getting married in a Quaker meeting. (laughs) Yet, our parents became friends. Our children, of course, that changes everything, but the children beloved by all. And when I finally went to Ireland, I didn't know quite what to expect. We have so many stereotypes of the Irish, correct? Some of us may have had that as part of our cultural narrative. And I was able to bring my students more than once to the Glen Cree Center for Reconciliation. And a colleague at Loyola Marymount set up a several-year program of bringing perpetrators and victims together to talk through the resentment, to talk through the resistance, to talk with an honesty that allowed many of them to come to a place of healing. And what I learned at Glen Cree, which ironically was originally a British garrison, and then had been a boarding school for Catholic orphans, and then was in the 1990s converted to this really innovative center for healing. What I learned is that as they met with one another, they uncovered these amazing stories of people who held incredible guilt for having been pardoned, for families of British soldiers, working class families whose boys had been killed in Northern Ireland, who'd never ever been able to tell their story to anyone who had never been recognized. And I saw the bravery of the social scientists, the psychotherapists, the people of the secular community that put their minds together to create a program to bring healing. And then the last and the most minor contribution I would like to offer is just a little story about how I've had to find ways to work to places of reconciliation. And of course, I've never suffered. I'm a little bit too young to have been 
drafted into the Vietnam War, just barely young. And I'm a little bit too old to have worried about some of the other wars that followed. But yet all of us, as we know from the Bhagavad Gita, as we know from the work of Mahatma Gandhi and his interpretation of the Bhagavad Gita, all of us every day encounter struggles. Thankfully, usually fairly small, but all of us in the world of family, in the world of work, in the world of these wonderful nonprofits that many of us become involved with, it's always trouble, trouble around the corner, trouble somewhere. And what I've been able to do is to, in my moments of distress, is to go into a place of quiet and always ask the question, how much am I contributing to the problem. What is my need? And giving the benefit to everyone else, trying to figure out what it is that will make my heart heal so that I can be in a place of comfort with those who I feel have aggrieved me. And following this process, University administrators, family members, nonprofits, having a little bit of a scuffle. Iba had alluded to all of these possible arenas in which we struggle. And like Gandhi, what I would like to think is that by asking those questions, how much am I contributing to the problem? And by trying to be honest and then have the bravery to go and set forth my perception of the situation and open myself in a willing heart to be corrected. And that way, by the facilitation of communication, I feel that I've been able to be a little bit of a better person in a few circumstances, and emulate these amazing people such as Nelson Mandela, who have, in fact, transformed our world for the better. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chappell, those beautiful words and insight that we all need. Uh, I would like to point your attention to the note cards on your table. Uh, they have pens next to them. Uh, you are welcome to write any questions or comments that you have as it relates to any of the speakers or the discussion that will follow. And the ushers will come around and take those cards and present them to the moderator during the discussion. So we would love for you to be a part of the conversation. And the note cards at your table are the way to do so. Okay. One of my favorite people on the face of the earth. Uh, Najiba Saeed Miller is Assistant Professor of Interreligious Education, Founder and Director of the Center for Global Peace Building, and Director of Interreligious Programs at the Center for Engaged Compassion at Claremont School of Theology, the Center for Engaged Compassion. Her work includes gang interventions, diversity training in universities and public agencies, conflict resolution in public schools, and interreligious dialogue among the Abrahamic traditions, Please help me welcome Dr. Najiba Saeed Miller. I greet you with peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And on top of peace, I greet you with the blessings of mercy, aspirational for the future, for tomorrow, but even maybe more importantly, for the moment that we are all building together. So I have the pleasure of, of meeting Dr. Hassan Hatout as a young girl, and then meeting his wonderful daughter, and then meeting his granddaughter when I come to speak here at USC, who was president of the Interfaith Council. So if anyone wants to see a family that produces Muslim women that are in the forefront of interfaith action of the highest academic caliber, you need look no further than the family and the patriarch that
that we saw here. So patriarchy in a good way, not the patriarchy that keeps women from engaging. I just wanted to point that out. That's also one of his legacies, is his engagement of women at the table and uh, seeing the eloquence of those that are around him. Clearly, he and his wife have passed on a tremendous heritage that has lasted three generations. So the fourth generation is the bridge to tomorrow. We'll see, inshallah. I'm sure it will continue. So I wanted to speak briefly about the importance of the work of the foundation as an interfaith space and then because Dr. Hatout was a poet, give you four uh, alliterative or four uh, ways that we engage in peacemaking. So this evening is important because it represents a third discursive space. One in which a generative, critical discussion on the roles of religion, ethics, affect, and social conditions can inform and transform and form one another. It does this with epistemic commitments beyond the usual narrow suspects that we have of definitions of religion. So Dr. Hatout introduced us to talking about poetry as part of our commitment to our interpretation of our religious experience. So the openness and the definition of religion is a very powerful legacy that he gives us in reconciliation. And more importantly, in the interfaith space, we are all on an equal playing field for the communities of scholarship represented here tonight at the table. And this is very important because it's different than a normative belief in the validity of all approaches. We don't need to come to an agreement on the validity. However, very few are the spaces in which we can publicly perform the internal exploration of religious traditions with a critical eye and also cast a glance at the experience of someone else who occupies a space at the proverbial table and at the larger landscape of society. We should not confuse multi-religious spaces for watered-down, diluted scholarship. Here are ethics of disagreement, which Dr. Hatout talked about ethics very often. Our ethics of disagreement elevates our discourse, sharpens our scholarly pen, and produces a result of inter-religious education that is not only appreciative, but also intellectually rigorous in pointing out when religion has damaged humans and humans have damaged religion. One thing I want us to keep in mind is Dr. Hatout was a critical thinker. He combined two things that are hard to find these days, compassion and critical thinking. So this is something that we have as part of his legacy, is not a blind following of one vision or version of the world, but this idea of a critical engagement. So I was asked to give some sort of a Muslim perspective um, on, on reconciliation, and I wanted to point out that we have, one of, uh, we have a beautiful internal tradition and a beautiful diversity of viewpoints. So tonight I'm only going to give you a glimpse into the landscape. And I wanted to use just four brief points of entry, and forgive me, I'm now an academic, into the hermeneutical and exegetical exercises that will be necessary to further deepen our engagement with religious texts from a Muslim perspective. So we start off with, so I'm going to give you four items very quickly, this idea of, the, of humanizing in conflict. The idea of an ethic of humility in conflict. The idea of an ethic of hope in reconciliation. And finally, we end with the vision that Dr. Hatout, his whole life embodied, the wholeness of humankind. So what do we learn about the substance of the body? The primary and primal intervention of love in the corrupted rendition of human life as you and I experience it is this a reconfiguration of the dismembering, the separation of the heart, the mind, and the soul. Dehumanizing and dislocation of dignity is performed publicly in societies when we take away the question of the sacral element of ruh, the spirit that carries God breathed into the body when we are encased in the literal and transcendental womb. To marshal man-made resources, in this fight against the human body is a fundamental denial of God's very existence. 
So I'm transfixed by the vast multitudes of definition of love in our tradition. Dr. Hatut's obsession with love fits 1400 years of discourse on love within the Muslim tradition. One might spend a lifetime unlocking each word to discern how love plays to the profound centripetal force magnetizing the human being from our very beginning. The Quran says the human form, our bodies, was a gift from God as creation in its most excellent emanation, ahsin taqweem, the most beautiful, the most excellent. So you and I, we are encased in the casing of love. The body is love itself. So William Chittick says that Ibn al-Arabi began his long chapter on love as he begins most of his 560 chapters by citing relevant Quranic verses and prophetic saying. He points out first that love is a divine attribute and he lists several of the Quranic verses in which God is the subject of the verb to love. Fourteen of these verses mention those whom God loves and another 23 mention those whom God does not love. In every case, the objects of God's love or lack of love are human beings. Again, the human form. Indeed, the Quran associates love only with humans among all creatures. Our capacity to have access to divine love is a human right. It's a part of the human condition. It defines both the fragility and the strength of our relationship with God. So I was mentioning Chittick and what I just said was, uh, was some reflections on him. Hence, love, Chittick says, is a key term if we are to understand what differentiates human beings from other created beings. Most other divine attributes, Chittick says, such as life, knowledge, desire, power, speech, generosity, justice, mercy, and wrath, have no necessary connection with the human race. So this idea of love as a human condition is something we can all appreciate both as the gift that God has given us and in the human form. This, uh, so this is this idea of humanizing. One of the things that we heard was this idea of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Prophet Muhammad's mission to humankind, and embodied and spoken of by Dr. Hatut is that the mission is to be but a mercy to humankind. Now it's not a mercy to just Muslims. It's not a mercy just to my family. It's a mercy to all of humankind. So when I talk about peacemaking, I talk about it as a process of humanizing one side for the other. You know, what's interesting is most peacemakers, I've done hundreds of conflicts, people don't really care about what they're fighting about. They care about the process of being dehumanized. So one of the things we learn is that the humanizing of one side for the other is the key to reconciliation. The second ethic I want to talk about is humility. So the Qur'an talks about even in the way you walk on earth, the way you walk on earth should be light in its footprint. So you should know a Muslim, you should know a believer by the way that they walk on earth that they show humility. It is an embodied aspect of worship that we show our humility even in the gentleness of our walk. And many, many other traditions talk about gentleness. So one of the things that we talk about with doing reconciliation, I've, I, I myself, as you heard, have done all kinds of mediations. And one of the things we learned from Dr. Hatut's example and from the stories that he told is that the people who are closest to the conflict have the solution. The people who are closest to the conflict are the ones who know what to do with it. It is not you and I coming in. It is not you and I telling people what to do. It is the humility that we embody as Dr. Hatut did. I want you to pay attention to his voice. His embodiment of humility shows what in the Qur'an, Luqman, um, a sage uh, advisor, told his son, be moderate in thy pace and be moderate in thy voice, because the louder you get, the worst of sounds is the braying of a donkey. Keep in mind how we even speak and how moderate is our voice. Are we speaking with humility? So the second thing I wanted to point out was this idea of the ethic of hope. Every prophetic tradition 
has this ethic of hope. So the prophets, all of the prophets from Adam and as Muslims include uh, all the way to Prophet Muhammad, they essentially saw a world that was not in yet in existence. I love the story of Prophet Noah, Nuh. He was told to go build a boat. He had this irrational, if you were to look at that, people, he, he, people were laughing at him, people were making fun of him, but yet he went and did this project. So this idea of having hope, of embodying hope, of producing hope, of being hopeful, of being hopeful against all odds, that is a prophetic tradition that we all share. And the currency of Noah's power, the currency of Prophet Isa, Jesus' power, was never wealth, it was never money, it was never the ability to hurt people, it was their ability to hope against the odds of any rational subjugation of stopping their dream and their ability to see the beauty that others could not yet see. So how do you and I embody hope? When I go mediate conflicts, the most dangerous thing I do is to go in and not be hopeful. The minute I give up hope, the minute I throw up my hands, everyone else in the room does. So how can you and I go into conflicts and use the gift of faith instead of the damage of religion? What about the gift of religion that the divine connection to our Creator allows us to carry hope with us? The last thing I will end with is this idea of wholeness. We used to think that groups were formed in common enemy. Now the work of Patinsky and Allophilia allows us to see that the way we can build community is actually through deep connection and through love for one another. So God describes God as the full manifestation of justice and of power and of beauty. The push towards justice as the measure of a society and a human are often emphasized and pushed as the key religious identity. One of the misguided notions, in my opinion, is the presentation of relationship of rahmah and adal, of justice and mercy as a dialectical one, a competitive one, so that one exists where the other doesn't. What if we change the relationship between mercy and justice to a dialogic one? Mercy implies, I wanted to, to just share this with you, that might not the divine intervention of God expose us beyond the linear lens of justice and mercy as oppositional. So there's Imam al-Ghazali says that mercy implies a pain-inducing empathy which lays hold of the compassionate one. This moves a merciful person to satisfy the wants of the object of mercy. So human beings are... We feel the pain of others. But what is profound, as Imam al-Ghazali says, is that div the divine has an infinite capacity to show empathy. So part of our relationship with God and with love is to lean on the divine to expand our narrow capacity for empathy. I can only feel so much pain in my human form. But that connection with God allows me to feel far more pain. So God does not show mercy to those who do not show mercy to, to others. This is a famous saying of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. The vertical relationship with God and the justice we receive from God is inextric inextricably linked with the mercy we show fellow human beings. Divine interventions of love and mercy are really the highest form of love that God shows us and the highest form of love we show one another. A co-creation of beauty on earth is possible between the horizontal showing of mercy between humans, between you and I, and the reliance on the divine light for expanding our hearts in the pursuit of showing mercy for each other. So what I wanted to end was for us to think about how do we evolve mercy? How do we evolve mercy? How do we practice mercy in small things so that when the big things come, when I'm asked to show mercy for someone who has really hurt me, have I exercised the muscle of that heart? Have I exercised my capacity so that when I'm asked those big questions and someone says, you've been hurt, 
But I ask you to ask for forgiveness. Have we practiced it with our spouse? Have we practiced it with our children? Have we practiced it with someone we don't like? It's easy to show mercy to someone you like. Try for a day to show mercy to someone you don't like. So I will end with this idea of one of the forms of restorative justice that I practice. Howard Zayer is the father of restorative justice. I had the honor of, of addressing Eastern Mennonite University earlier this last year on um, Abrahamic peace building. And he says, restorative justice instead of retributive justice is a process to involve to the extent possible, those who have a stake in a specific offense to collectively identify and address the harms, the needs, and obligation in order to heal and put things right as possible. So, if we think about humanizing, we think about humility, we think about hope, and we think about community wholeness, really the resources exist in my tradition and they exist in yours. We love another human more than we are seeking a retribution for their lack of justice on us. For the sake of love, not just between you and I, but for the sake of God, we exercise a mercy. Love upon love upon love upon love. Wonderful. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Dr. Najiba Saeed Miller. Charles Randall Paul is board chair, founder, and president of the Foundation for Religious Diplomacy. Uh, he is a lifelong member of the Church of Jesus Christ for Latter-day Saints. He's lectured widely and written numerous articles on healthy methods for engaging differences in religions and ideologies. And he's currently completing two books. Uh, the first title I think you'll love, Fighting About God, Why We Do It, and How to Do It Better. And Converting the Saints, an American Religious Conflict. Uh, he's on the board of editors of the International Journal of Decision Ethics, and we welcome uh, Dr. Randall Paul. I, too, am very honored to uh, be asked to speak in the uh, tradition of Dr. Hatut and his brother who I know from uh, a few years ago, some great experiences we had in his home trying to understand how the Southern California Muslim community was integrating well into the American culture and keeping the strength of its difference alive too. So uh, again, I am grateful to be here. I hope my remarks are uh, certainly um, in the spirit of the event. I will say as a Latter-day Saint, um, that I speak as a Mormon Christian and those Christians in the room who would consider me either uh, untraditional or even heretical uh, I, uh, I will stand uh, put, put, put the notes on and we'll, we'll try to answer the questions if, if, they, if it comes out of uh, uh, a voice that says eh, I didn't quite get it right from uh, your perspective but uh, I uh, again uh, I'm grateful that um, in all, all the work I do, we have always an empty chair at our table uh, to symbolize that we can't speak for everyone in our own faith, we can't speak for any, everyone in our own community, we can't speak for everyone in the seven billion people in the world, but we keep that empty chair there as a reminder to all of us we'd like to have seven billion people at the table, but it isn't going to happen. And so we need to see each other as as giving a gift to each other and in this limited group tonight um, and think about those who aren't with us and how they might respond um, with their different opinions on, on what we're talking about. Uh, my uh, remarks will, I think, take two big ideas I'd like to talk about. One is uh, conciliation, not reconciliation, and the other one is contamination. And, and I like to call it mutual contamination. And I'll talk about the benefits of all these as I, I go through um, my remarks. Conciliation comes from the term conciliare, a, a Latin term, which means to assemble, to meet in council. It then uh, and also began to imply to win over or to persuade. It then 
moved as you read the derivation of the word over time. It came to gain goodwill or to become friendly with and then go to be compatible with and to pacify and ultimately to unite in agreement. The original word was to meet and counsel, to persuade. It's moved to mean to get together to agree. And I would say that's a bad idea. That's a deeply bad and flawed idea for conciliation. And I'll, I'll go through that with you in a minute here. I want to say effectively that what is in our mind in terms of the goal of God and the goal of your religious tradition will affect deeply how you feel and think about the topic we're talking about today. So I'm going to ask you all for a moment to think about heaven from your point of view. Okay? If we've got agnostics in the room, just poeticize it. But those of you who are, or, uh, have come from a tradition, think about it. Is heaven a place of ultimate tranquility where unity means we need not speak because we all think and feel identically? Is your idea of heaven effectively a convergence into a silent unity? Peace. Or is your idea of heaven more like an Italian dinner with the big family? or Jewish, for that matter, Muslim, you can name it, where there is a divergence going on, an, an ongoing conversation that gets rather lively. But the feeling around the table is there's something going on around that table that we've heard about tonight, Dr. Hattu talks about, which we call love, that keeps the feeling level in all the argument at a, at a humble, well, I won't even use the word humble, at a more quiet tenor. So that something that is being spoken between the parties, the nonverbal communication is, I love you. You're dead wrong about your argument, but I love you. Or I love you. You know, I just can't see it from your point of view. You know, I just don't get you, but I love you. Whatever your idea was of heaven, did it go one way or another? Did you think in terms of fecundity and creativity and difference, real difference, that would keep eternity actually interesting? Or did you think in terms of a more unifying, convergent idea where there are no problems because problems are the problem? I would say that in our world today, where we're doing the work we're doing on reconciliation, it matters deeply what you think the end game is. And uh, if, if this is explicitly brought to the table in all conversations early on, it has a powerful effect on how people would see their temporary state here in this world if they're religious people. William James, who is my favorite American philosopher, wrote an essay that I'd recommend to all of you called The Sentiment of Rationality, in which he said, the personal human temperament, your own personality, has much more to do with what you choose to believe than you would allow. And he basically says, we all come in our in our family backgrounds and in our DNA, whatever the, the ultimate reasons are for these things, we're differently wired, so to speak, to prefer one way of being religious than another. And we find theological arguments and, ra and uh, rational philosophical points of view to support our aesthetic and personal view of the world. So your idea of heaven might be a little different than mine based on, on that difference of your personality type. Whether this is true or not, I find it extremely useful when we're talking about this question. Because 
if you talk with someone about Tawhid, Tawhid in, in, uh, or unity in uh, Islam, for example, and the idea is we can get to this one correct view that Allah has for this particular interpretation of the Quran or for this particular way of being in the world. Or if you're a Christian and you take this view that we're trying to get to this one pure and correct way of seeing this, that will make it, or if, if you're a Buddhist and you want to say ultimately the enlightened way is this way, you can see how the way you'd look at your interlocutor, your partner, your opponent, your rival is different because usually what happens is if you have that one way idea, which might be true, by the way, I'm not making a claim for or against it. I'm talking as a social psychologist here. The idea usually comes down to something like this. We've talked about Oha, oh, the spirit. If God is somehow in me, God does not contradict. He doesn't contradict. There's only, he doesn't, he isn't a postmodern philosopher on the one hand and on the other hand. He's God. And so he's, he's saying the truth to me. And I can't deny, I feel, I know it. I know it's something in me. So if this person disagrees with me on this thing that I know that comes from God, this person must somehow either be a little stupid, not quite have it all together, or perhaps uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give them the, the benefit of the doubt. They're just really naive, really been duped by their tradition. You know, they don't have the vocabulary. Somehow, they don't get it. Or third, they know the truth and they've sold out to the dark side. Right? They're lying. They're just flat out lying. Those three positions that we have in inter-religious, or for that matter, any kind of serious conversation with someone, politics, you know, you can take it to sports even, but I won't go that far. Uh... That is a deep problem in, in human relations, in all social, psychological, and all interfaith relation, relationships. Is there, I ask you, within your religious tradition, within your heart and mind, the possibility of a fourth way? Is there a possibility that God might actually desire there to be disagreement over ultimate truth in the world? And if so, what good would that do? Well, I'll, I'll take you quickly to uh, a couple of stories. We'll go with the, the Hebrew tradition first, this Tower of Babel. Most of you know that story in which all mankind had one language, one religion. Technology was really quite potent. I mean, they could build it. You know, they got together and it was unity, ultimate unity. And they were building a tower. The motive isn't quite clear, but the idea is after a flood, you want to get out of uh, the possibility of there being more water. And so let's get up to heaven with a tower. And if you read the, the Hebrew scripture, it isn't quite clear what the motive of God is. Most people tend to spin it by saying, well, he cursed the people with uh, the different languages that created different nations and different religions. But if you read the text, it doesn't say he cursed them. So we'll just leave that out there as a possibility that there might have been a benign and loving element of the motivation of God to create different nations, different religions in the world. Because the people weren't getting it. They thought they could build a tower to heaven. Whereas... Perhaps the question was, could they build love in their hearts? And only through having deep and unreconcilable, as Kierkegaard said, rack your brain differences, could there be a way of testing whether they did love others. In the, in the uh, Christian tradition, of course, we have Jesus' great line, Hey... If you love your family, your friends, you get no points for that. The Republicans and sinners do that. 
Anybody laugh at my joke? The, the publicans, the, the tax collectors and sinners. I, this isn't a very liberal group, I can tell you. Um, the, in other words, you can see where Jesus is pushing there. At the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he pushes to the point, <laughs> you get no points for loving people that love you. Love your enemies. Most Christians, of course, came away saying, oh yeah, that's... That's beyond. I mean, that's, that's the graduate school of uh, Christianity. We'll believe that for the next life. We'll put that on the, the table for a minute and then come to my favorite scripture. In the Surah 5, the table, or the banquet, the banquet, um, verse 48, uh, the prophet was told that God could have created all mankind as one. Implication being there, all nations, the, the na nations is one, Babel-like, one religion, one people. But he didn't. And, but it, and it actually gives the purpose, an astounding scripture. I don't know of any other scripture like it. It says, in order to create competition between religions over virtue, over goodness, he created many nations. The idea of vying with each other in a contest of virtue is a very, very profound social psychological reading of humanity by our divine creator. That we, as William James said, we want something that is so important that we're, living to, we're, li we're willing to give our lives for it. James said, we want a moral equivalent of war. Sounds like jihad on one level, right? We want that in our souls. To, to, to take that out makes life a little uninteresting to humanity. And so we have this deep idea, deep in the Quran, and I think the other religious faiths could learn from it, that there is some ultimate purpose in this competition of difference, especially in the competition of love that is the fundamental issue at hand. I like to say at our foundation that we know your religion best by observing how your religion treats those who are your deepest rivals. We actually use the word rival because it has the right edge. And I will leave you with this idea tonight that everything we're doing and we've got some initiatives going on in the Middle East and in America. It's based on changing the heart. People have to desire to live with their rivals. They have to desire to live with them as rivals. Not as people who have converted over and are becoming boringly like we are. This desire, this, this is not a normal thing in human being. And we see it and feel it in only in having a new experience where someone who is our rival shows us in that moment that they're not stupid, that they're not duped, and they're not evil. They are profoundly wrong, perhaps, in their religious belief or their political position, from your point of view. But they do not fit in the old box you have this feeling when, that comes back from them that they actually are very admirable people. And you leave that experience, what we call the great success of religious, we don't call it dialogue, we call it diplomatic engagement, is when all parties leave that room, they look up to God and say, Why God, have you not made the truth? clear and obvious to that beautiful, amazing human being that I just left? Why have you left her or him in a lesser position than you have enlightened us with? That's a perfect prayer for humanity. That's enough. Because it's deeply real and it shows the desire you have for God to bless that person with every good possible thing. And your lack of knowledge on why it has, has, has not yet happened. Your own humility is therefore exposed. You are not, you no longer are standing in for God yourself and judging the person. Oh, the person must be obviously 
you know, evil or going to hell because they disagree with me. It's this deep moment that allows you to hold on to that difference that you have. You can't deny your faith. You have it in a superior way to other people. Otherwise, you'd have their faith. <laughs> you'd join their church. You'd join their religion. We've got to stop pretending that all faiths are equal to you in your heart. That's like saying all women are equal to your wife or to your husband. All men are equal to your husband. It's, it's, it's a lie, right? We've got to be able to get over this problem and live with each other in this deep contest of rivalry. I leave you with a Mormon idea. We also deeply believe that God is, is a loving person and that God um, believe, actually desires all of his children to rise as high as possible in goodness and in love. And a philosopher of Mormonism once said, we believe in a God who, when it comes to love, would be delighted to be surpassed. It would be a win-win for the universe. It's a very deep idea that, I, that coming out of Asian traditions, you hear, if the child has not surpassed the parent, both have failed. In this sense, we believe God wants us all to rise to the highest possible capacity of love. That's the great competition that we talk about in Surah 548. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. If I can invite all of our speakers back on stage. You'll find it. If I can invite all of our speakers back on stage. Well, thank you all for... Your very wise words. Uh, we have a bit of time uh, for dialogue and engagement. And Dr. Ibet, I will hand the floor over to you. Well, first I'd like to um, express my deep appreciation uh, for someone who has rescued me today. Uh, and if you've noticed, I'm in the habit of pointing to the MC, oh, do this, and this is still not that, and all, because so far in all our previous five years, the MC has either been my daughter or my son. And um, neither of them could be with us today, and so I have this MC who's definitely ahead of me because he knows what I don't know. He knows the little sheets and question marks are on the table and everything, and, and here I am thinking, Oh, I'm telling my daughter or son, do this and do that. I really want to take a moment to express my deep gratitude to our MC tonight, Ahmed Yunus. I'm sure it took you the loving of it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I learned uh, a lot from my daughter and my son. Uh, I'm not going to let the opportunity of having a Mormon on my panel and dwell into interfaith issues before asking, what is your secret about family? How do you manage to keep your families together and to do it so well in an age uh, where families of all traditions all over the world are suffering? Can't you ask the problem of evil or something easy like that? Uh, first of all, uh, the Latter-day Saints, the Mormons, have problems in their families too. Believe me, everyone's no. got problems. <laughs> and uh, I will just say that uh, I think uh, Joseph Smith's um, basic idea I know that there's supposed to be the seal of a prophet, but, uh, you know, Joseph Smith, we think, sneaked in there after Muhammad. And, uh, <laughs> I didn't hear that. <laughs> um, his idea was one that I think did very profoundly unite the idea of tribal family. As, there's no heaven without the tribe. 
he said that the same degree of social life that exists in this world exists in heaven. Mormons actually believe in heavenly parents that there's a family in heaven. They go to this the temple and in the, t in the Mormon temple the highest ritual is there's an altar and the man and the woman literally face each other over the altar put their hands in each other's hand and the priest stands back and instead of facing the priest the man and the woman face each other and if they're if they have children all the children put their hands over the par parents hands and they say yes to their eternal family they say we are going to be a family that lives in eternity together this ritual is is the highest mormon ritual and so joseph smith though he took the Christian idea of personal salvation very seriously. Every, everyone has to be uh, a sinner and then repent of the sin. The, the idea is the relationship in a family is the fundamental unit of heaven, not just earth. And I think that's a powerful um, thing that Mormons feel guilty about if they're screwing up, right? And uh, guilt works. Um, but also they aspire for it. You go to most Mormon families and they've got this little, this little non-scriptural line someplace in their, a plaque in their house saying, families are forever. And that means, effectively for a Mormon, you know, divorce um, or, or putting your kid out if the kid's in, throwing them out of the house if they're having problems. You can't get rid of your wife. You can't get rid of your husband. <laughs> you can't get rid of your kid. That person is going to be there as an eternal person in your life. You've got to work it out. And so there's this, this, I'll just say that there's a theological and a sociological aspect to answer your questions. But anything we can learn from our Muslim, our Jewish, our Hindu, our, for that matter, our secular friends to help us with our families. We'll take all the help we can also get. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, why is a lot of conflict, historically and in current times, done in the name of God and religion? Why, why over and over? And why things like never again happen again? Why, why isn't humanity learning from its mistakes? And why is religion always the culprit? All speakers. <laughs> That's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the, this is a little bit in the way, so I just wanted to um, see the faces of the folks on this side of the room. And historically and biologically, religion gives people a sense of assuredness. And assuredness is a wonderful thing but there's also an unfortunate byproduct is that as soon as we think that we're right and that someone else is wrong, we open the opportunity for conflict. And throughout history, religion has been with us. And it becomes associated with cultures, it becomes associated with tribes, it becomes associated with language. And when conflict flares up, everything, I think all of us have experienced anger and a little bit lost our cool, so to speak, and we'll use anything, including religion. And the language of religion is a language generally of power. And I think that that's the beginning point, and for some, the end point of trouble. But on the other hand, the example that I cited earlier of reconciliation being made possible by the works of people such as Mahatma Gandhi, such as Nelson Mandela, such as those who agreed to sit with one another at the peace table in regard to Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland, I think that this gives hope that in the contemporary age, boundaries are falling 
understanding and communication are on the rise. And if we look at the number of deaths due to war, that they are certainly diminished compared to the middle of the 20th century. So I think that our understanding is rising, our communication has improved. And just to put a word in, uh, in a word for Noah, okay, um, we face a new Noah era, and that um, may or may not be a flood, but we're going to have to have a little bit more ingenuity if our grandchildren and great-grandchildren are going to be able to flourish. And we have different problems than we had before, and many of these problems are, in fact, human-caused. So hopefully we can put aside religious conflict and unite for the benefit of all humanity. Take a shot. Take a shot. Not to use violent language, take a shot. <laughs> so um, I would just say really quickly that actually most of the violence that's happening in our uh, world right now is not between people of different religions. It's very often people of the same tradition. So I just want to point that out because in conflict resolution theory and practice, we find the most bloody conflicts have not been between people who are very different. It's between people who share some resources and need access to those resources. So I just wanted to point that out. I think it's a mis misapprehension uh, that people of different religions are always and have always been at war. If you look at a, lot, at a lot of the violence, I think one thing that has not had enough attention in modern age is how do people within one tradition engage in, um, in ethics of disagreement that isn't weaponized because I think that that's very important and how are religious minorities within a tradition or minority viewpoints, how are they engaged, protected, and how is dissent? So I want to put that out there because I think there's this myth that people of different religions are always fighting and killing one another and it gives and takes away attention from our own ecumenicism within our traditions. And I think it's actually one of the costs and the rise of the interfaith movement. I'm very excited about the interfaith movement, but I think sometimes we've forgotten to look inwardly and look at how traditions are engaging with each other. So when I talk about a Christian, what is a Christian doing internally in their tradition? What is a Muslim doing to engage with other Muslims? Um, so I just want to point that out. I think sometimes when we share some identity, we actually have more ways. Think of two people who've been in a long-term relationship. They know how to insult each other a lot better than two strangers. <laughs> this is why I don't do divorce mediation anymore. It's really hard. Um, just really, the other thing, I, so I just want the in, intra-religious conflict needs a lot more resources and a lot more attention. And um, I think especially in America, the polarization between religions, I think is often not as great as a polarization within in different traditions. Um, the other thing is I think we've spent too much time thinking of peace as an abstraction. We, I, I can't tell you, I can't go to any more seminars where people just tell me either Islam is a religion of peace, Christianity is a religion of peace, but then I don't know how to actually practice that. So I think we need to move away from platitudes and these big things that are very defensive, saying this religion is peace. Because I teach in the field of education, I think a lot about, well, how are you teaching peace? How are you taking and how are you teaching your children your, I do much more higher ed consultation, but how are we building systems that actually take these beautiful abstractions of religion and integrate them into actual practice? So I'm also in the area of practical theology. That's probably why as well. But I think it's really important. I, I feel like we lose a lot of opportunity opportunities by allowing people to talk about religion way too abstractly or just give us a verse from the, their holy text. We need to know how to operationalize rahmah, operationalize mercy. What is the definition of mercy? How is your institution showing it? How are you embodying it? And what does it mean? The last thing I would say is that there have been great minds and resources and money given to war. Generationally, we've invested far more in war and the theories that go into war making and the industries that go into that. So I think one of the things we can think about with Dr. Hassan, the importance of thinking about 
how do we develop, I think the key is not theologies of peace, much more theologies of interdependence. How do we begin to recognize we live in a time where war will decimate populations? And how do we have and understand and have difference, but also recognize our interdependence upon one another? My destiny is your destiny in this world. So instead of talking so much about exclusive truth claims around heaven and hell, how are we making heaven and hell with each other in this life? Does that make sense? So how are we theologizing? My kids are at home, which is good. Sorry, I'm a mother of two children. So if you see me, I just want to make sure my husband got out of the airport, picked them up from my mother-in-law's house, and took them home. So that's why I'm checking my text messages. I need peace at home. <laughs> You really believe in that can happen? Okay. <laughs> How old are your kids? <laughs> okay. we should, we've been on many panels together. If you can't tell, we end up the Mormon and the Muslim. We should do a traveling show. <laughs> I wanted to say very quickly that um, I do, and, and we started out uh, the foundation some 15, 18 years ago now called the Foundation for Interreligi Interreligious Diplomacy. And as uh, Najib just said, we quickly came to realize that intra-religious diplomacy had to predate any honest inter-religious diplomacy. And so I couldn't agree more. We changed the name of our foundation to simply the Foundation for Religious Diplomacy <laughs> so that we would get, gain both those aspects under that. I think we dodge a, um, an important issue in our lives, modern that we are, and that's the issue I, was, I didn't talk about it in my talk enough, so I'll, I'll just quickly add it on here. And that's the issue of contamination. How many of you would feel comfortable, whatever your background is, um, with someone of, just imagine, by the way, the, the philosophy or the religion you most personally find distasteful. Okay, don't say it out loud, but just think about it. And then think of your prized 21-year-old son or daughter coming home with one of those. Okay? <laughs> How would you feel? How would you feel? This is, this is the reality all over the world. Whether it's politics or religion, if we can't face that reality of being contaminated, having the tribe or the family, the perfect family, the perfect tribe, the perfect religion, somehow being contaminated by this icky other stuff. Okay? This is real. This is the foundation of much religious conflict in the world. Okay, And we can't say they're foolish people who feel that way or you, because it's real. We do contaminate each other. So all I can say is um, we are working on a new model called the model of mutual contamination. <laughs> where we realize it's with, with modern uh, interaction, it's almost impossible wherever you are to quarantine your family, to quarantine whoever you want to quarantine and keep them from the influence of others. How far does it go? How, what is your ethic going to be? What do you teach your children? Can they not eat with others? In the ancient world, they couldn't because that meant they could intermarry. They, they were human. And if you wanted to keep the tribe pure, you wouldn't eat with other people. Can, can they date others? Right? How far does it go? This is a practical question that we all need to face in our own lives. And this is the level of desire for interaction and love of others. This is where it happens, where they feel your part. You can come in to the inner circle or you can't. And we, if we're honest about it, it's not that we don't love them. It's we don't want them to change the pureness that we have that will change if we bring them in. This is the problem of our, our world today. And I, just, I want to put that out there, that these people who have conflicts, intra or inter, are not idiotic to have those conflicts. These are real differences in our lives. So several questions are around the theme of how do you forgive in the face of injustice that has not yet been resolved. So if a persecuted forgives, is he or she weak? How are they going to regain their rights? Historically, the Muslim community remembers Bosnia, 
the Christian community remembers the Irish in England, uh, America remembers the African Americans, and today in America we're not going to ignore uh, there are people in Guantanamo Bay and in the Middle East there are political prisoners, there's torture, there's injustice, and how um, how can we talk reconciliation? Can any of the speakers comment on politics preventing reconciliation? And what about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict? Uh, what, how would you resolve it? I think you should start. Oh, really? <laughs> You know, that's a lot of different questions in one. And I always tell my students, a good professor doesn't give you the answer, but asks you questions that make you have more questions. And then they're like, well, why are we paying you to teach this class? I thought you were going to give me answers. I think we're talking about a lot of different things. It's important to keep in mind interpersonal conflict. Intrapersonal conflict means we have layers of conflict. There's intrapersonal within one person. If we think of the Muslim concept of jihad and nafs, the internal struggle for establishing goodness in yourself, that's intrapersonal. There's interpersonal between people. Then there's institutional conflict and um, conflict that really engages a really broad spectrum. So when we talk about forgiveness, it has to be a contextual conversation. So when I talk about forgiveness, am I talking about interpersonally? Intrapersonally, sometimes we don't even forgive ourselves, actually. So I just want to point that out. I think when we talk about forgiveness, to understand what exactly are we talking about and not to impose one solution on every conflict. I want to point out, though, a lot of times, um, a lot of times what we're talking about is also contested narratives. People have different versions of history or conflicts. And so what I've found in going in conflicts is that when people have contested narratives, they're not actually talking about the conflict that's happening at the moment. And this extends to conflicts here in Los Angeles between ethnic communities. As we see shifts of populations, there are major issues that we need to address in our own community here in LA. So I want to point out that I think one of the things that's really important is for a community to heal and have a conversation about its own history. And I think that that is um, something that is an internal process and also can engage in a restorative justice process people from other communities. But I think it's very difficult to assume that everyone has the same version of a narrative and to reconcile those narratives. So can there be an internal restorative justice process? One of the things that has been profound about the South African experience, the Rwandan experience, has been a mass production of reconciliation of narratives and engaging in the truth. But I think that's what we find in conflict resolution is the need for procedural justice, not for an outcome, for one thing that has to be done, but for a process in which people have two things we find in research. They have the ability to express themselves and they have the ability to feel heard. And I think that's what we're missing in many of these conflicts is some brokering of a process in which people are really listened to and really heard. And I wanted to just, um, I just wanted to say those things because I think, I think we have to be really um, careful about proclaiming one solution for all conflicts or also to assume that it took us this many years to get in a conflict, it could take us that many years to get out of it. And um, so those are some of the things I would reflect upon. And just really last of all, from a Muslim perspective, I think part of the question is, why are we always, why is the conversation about mercy being the alternative to justice? I still hear that very often. And why can't mercy be the path to justice? That's just a question I have in process. I love that. I, I, from an LDS stamp, standpoint, mercy is just, and justice is merciful. It's a, I'm with you on that. That the, the dichotomy is. Can I can I just pick mm. up on this? In uh, answer to that question, I would I would uh, say that we have a couple of things going on here. One. Uh, 
marriage is a great example. John Gottman's work uh, has overturned marriage theory in the last 30 years by examining long-term successful marriages in which he has found that two-thirds of the conflicts in long-term successful marriages are never resolved. Only a third are resolved. The other two-thirds, the couple learns how to engage respectfully, not naggingly. The timing's important, um, but they, re re they revisit the issue of differences they have. Sometimes they're deep, but in a way that is, is considered a part of the marriage, a part of who they are. Again, this is crucial to any kind of conflict that we find is intractable, because when we look at it, on some levels, the conflict is desired by the parties. We, the world needs to realize that peaceful coexistence is a sham, it's phony. The only thing that really works is peaceful co-resistance and collaboration together in good marriages, in good politics, in good uh, religious communities, intra-religiously or between. The reality is at the, at the subatomic level, at the, at the biological level, at the social psychological level, and theological level, humans need to have a distance, they need to resist in order to embrace. Love doesn't make any sense if you're just so unified that there's no difference between you. And so this model of co-resistance co is something that we need to elevate in Israel right now. We're working on, in Egypt, working on what we call the four maps program. It's not a solution. It's a sustainable program to let the conflict go on in a different mode. Four maps are you have different views of the future. The eschatological end. You ask the, the Christians, how will the world end? You ask the Jews, how will it end? You ask the Shiites in Iran, how will it end? And you ask the Sunnis. This is a theological group where they throw their maps out on the table and they're shocked to see they're different. There's a different end. And then we ask the question, okay, what are you going to do about it? Are, are you in charge of bringing this about? Or is it a divine program? And inevitably they come to the conclusion that their map, now that it's been seen by the other side, now they've been heard by the other side, now they've come out of their theological closet and said, yes, our, but that's the superior map, that's the way it's going to end. They can relax. We've done a couple of experiments with this. They can relax more between each other and say, okay, we got a temporary map we need to work on. A temporary map. I know which one's going to be the real one, but there's, but let's work on the political and economic temporary map. It tends to take that edge off of not being heard and not being listened to by the rival. So you can see where I'm going with this, that we need more acknowledgement of the different end games people have in mind in the name of peace and realize, no, they really think they need to be in a contest over ultimate truth. The world among religious people is not between good and evil, it's between better and best. That's the only thing that matters, between better and best. And that's why this thing is going on within communities or between communities. Yeah, I'd like to echo two words that we've heard. One is empathy, and the other is communication. And there was a social scientist called Asutosh Varshne, University of Michigan, and he studied areas in India that are remarkable in their lack of discord. And what he discovered is something that reminds me of 2001 in this neighborhood. First, an example from India. In Kerala, which is approximately a third Muslim, and a third Hindu, and a third Christian, conflict? hasn't happened. And he went there and he, he just looked at all of the segments of society and he saw even the headloaders worked alongside one another. Now who knows, what's a headloader? Okay, there's actually a union, a national union for headloaders and headloaders are the people that you pay to carry stuff on their head. And in, in Kerala, there are Muslim headloaders, and there are Christian, and there are um, Hindu headloaders, and they all know each other. They see one another as human beings. And here in this neighborhood, 
um, September 12th. Immediately, the Buddhist community walked over to the mosque and said, we have been where you are right now. We will help you. And I'm told that it still continues. They still yearly meet to celebrate their fraternity and sorority with one another because the Japanese Americans, the Japanese Buddhists know what it's like. 100,000 sent away in concentration camps here in the United States of America and they extended a hand and said, let's let the world remember. And even if it doesn't make big news, we have to remember that what we have suffered, we want to share with you so that you know what to look for. And I think that the remarkable thing is, again, um, retributive violence. Yes, it happens, and less so than in decades past. So I was going to ask about the whole philosophy of accepting everything and forgiving everyone that I learned from um, listening to the teachings of the Dalai Lama and, uh, and how, how are they actually uh, so naturally born into this in spite of all the injustice that they are suffering. Um, but now another thought I want to touch on um, Gandhi was killed by a Hindu. Was that Hindu too Hindu or too different from Gandhi? Or, or, or what are your thoughts? Because uh, we all know of Muslim leaders being um, hurt by Muslims, uh, Christians, same way. So I, it just struck me that someone with the magnitude of the Mahatma uh, was murdered by people of his own faith when in fact he probably was the um, best known person of that faith in our times. So I, I wanted to invite your thoughts in particular on, on this. And is there a sense of guilt or is there a way of prevention um, that you can help us with? Yeah, if you're not familiar, I invite you to go back and look at the movie. And in the very opening scene, they show the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi by a radical who was of the opinion that his particular organization's interpretation of the faith was correct, and that Gandhi, by extending the olive branch repeatedly to Muslims, was wrong. It's one of the sad moments of our time. And we must also remember that Gandhi considered his campaign for independence a failure because of the partition of India. And those of us who are familiar with the, the tragedy of what happened in South Asia know the magnitude of migration of millions of people and the many, many, many lives that were lost this is a story that's not been sufficiently retold. So this underscores what Sayyid said earlier was that it's the intra-faith conflict to which we must be most attentive. What Gandhi himself stood for is self-correction. And one of his grandsons told me a story about a woman who was really worried about her young boy. And she went to the ashram, she went to Gandhi and said, you know, he's the only one, or rather she said, he will only listen to you, Mahatma. He's eating too many sweets. This isn't good for him. And then Gandhi said, well, have him come talk to me in a week. And she rather quizzically went away, and then she brought him back dutifully in a week, and he said, you must stop eating so many sweets. And then the mother said, well, why did you wait a week? 
And he said, well, I was eating too many sweets. <laughs> and what Gandhi always professed and practiced was that we have to begin with change at home in order to have any effect on the world. And in fact, he, after the terrible murder of so many trapped people in Amritsar, he pulled back for a good 10 years before again moving forward, wanting to be as careful as possible to make certain that the peaceful way was to be pursued. So although I know it sounds platitudinous, and I know it may sound a little bit trite, but what Gandhi's murder, I think, really shows us is that we can't control the world. All we can really control is ourself. All we can do is hope that our example will help improve the world, but recognize that some people, such as Joseph Smith, such as Mahatma Gandhi, thankfully, Muhammad died a peaceful natural death, uh, but there have been others in Islamic history who certainly have not had that gift. So again, this is the great paradox of what it means to be a human, the recognition that we have hatred hardwired into our biological impulses and that we're constantly inviting our rationality and our heart to override those base impulses. I was going to add something, is that okay? I just want to point out that forgiveness does not mean a cessation of advocacy. In fact, I think forgiveness advances better strategic advocacy. Because if we don't operate from actually looking at the conflict in front of us, and we are tied to a version of the conflict that happened maybe five generations ago, we may not actually be seeing what's going on around us. So I'm just pointing out that forgiveness can mean we forgive for so that we are able to move on and be better strategic advocates. Does that make sense to everyone? I think that that's really important because I think this idea of forgiveness is this importance and this need for self-healing and for individuals and what I do in my work, which is relational self-healing, that a community to begin to think about getting access to power one of the things I remember someone telling me when I started this work is one of the most dangerous things you can be is the victim of a victim. Because if we are not working on our capacity to do that healing, once we get access and move advocacy forward, then are we really going to wield that power in the most effective way? I just want to point that out. So I don't, I don't think these are binaries of if you seek forgiveness, especially with divine intervention, if you heal from the wounds inflicted upon you, that's between you and God, then you can seek a justice that is far more inclusive and far more durable. If you just react emotionally, the justice will be very, very ephemeral. And so I just wanted to point that out. The other thing is, um, Nonviolence has become a much more rich area of discourse. I wanted to engage all of you. My mentor just passed away in the field, actually, Glenn Stassen, who's the father of what we call just peacemaking. There was just war theory and there was pacifism. So I wanted to point out that nonviolence does not equal passivity or weakness. When we make a choice to engage in nonviolent action over violence, it doesn't mean that we're choosing to be less uh, strong in our position. So it could be a strategic choice to make the choice of nonviolence, but it has to be well thought out and it has to be um, looked at for historical reasons. When Rasulullah when Prophet Muhammad was in a position of prosecuting potentially all of the Quraysh who had done things to him at the at the at the end of his at the end of his life. He knew it wasn't just spiritually that he forgave them. It's strategic. He made friends with people who may have been his former enemies. And so thinking about these issues strategically is also important. So I wanted to point out nonviolence has a value spiritually, but it also has a strategic importance in being able to make wise choices in conflict resolution. And so Rasulullah is not just a spiritual leader, he's a strategically minded individual from which we can gain examples of how to think about engaging more effectively around conflict. 
couldn't have been more appropriate to use those uh, terms with respect to Gandhi himself, who um, saw all of his actions in a very um, clear um, context of gaining power, not losing power by what he did. And uh, the, the most interesting thing philologically to me, as I've thought about this over the last 30 years, is why we have not developed a word, a positive word, a verb for non-violence. It's a very, very deep and interesting um, philological question that talks about human society and what we think. But what a lot of the things I think that we've been talking about today is a, a positive way of engaging difference that isn't wimpy, that isn't mere tolerance, that's advocacy with love that gives a voice to the rival or the opponent to do the same. And this thing we're talking about is, is new. <laughs> it's, it's usually, in most power politics, it, religious or otherwise, it's silence the enemy, put them out of business, marginalize them, then you win. But we're in a strategic world today where to win, as William James would say, that religion that allows other religions to thrive the best will be the one that wins. It's a very interesting idea that that you have in the contest over the best, you want everyone to thrive and then you have self-confidence that your group will surpass in love and in goodness the others. And that's not a bad contest, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's a deep idea. The positive aspect, what is the positive of nonviolence? So I have to close the panel, and I'll do so with uh, one of my father's verses again. This one reads, For the wind that bloweth the sail is the mind, but the faith in the heart is the compass to guide. And what is eyesight if the heart is blind? Lo, we all look so good, but what is inside? Who is right? Who is wrong? Only God will decide. Thank you. That's the way 548 ends. Ladies and gentlemen, if I can direct your attention to the screen for a closing comment by Dr. Hassan Hathout. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, when they founded this country, uh, they wrote... Um, a series of articles in New York newspapers and um, one of those articles was written by Alexander Hamilton which became the first of the Federalist Papers and Alexander Hamilton said it seems to have been left to the people of this nation by their conduct and example to determine the question whether man will forever be destined to be ruled by fear and force or whether we can build a society and constitution that is sourced in reflection and choice I lived much of my life with Dr. Hassan, and I have many personal anecdotes. The one that I leave you with today is the simple statement that has come to define how I try to live on this earth. Ahmed, there are only two types of people on this earth. People with love in their heart, and people that do not have love in their heart. We love you. We respect you. May God bless you all. Drive safely. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>